Hello, and welcome to A Reader's History of Science Fiction, Season 2, Episode 5, our next interview episode, specifically following up on Episode 3 about constructed languages. I'm Alex Howe, and with me today is Dr. Paul Frummer. Uh, Dr. Frummer is a professor emeritus of clinical business communication at USC. He originally received his PhD from USC as well in linguistics, and he is best known for creating the Navi language for the movie Avatar. He also created the Barsoomian language for Disney's John Carter. Hello, Dr. Frummer. Thank you for coming on the show. Hey, Alex. It's my pleasure to be with you and to discuss the Navi language. So uh, to start out, you uh, did begin your career in linguistics. Uh, how did you get on that path? Well, um, my undergraduate degree is actually in mathematics. I got that from the University of Rochester in 1965. Uh, up to that point, I had had an interest in languages, having studied a fair number. Uh, as a Jewish kid growing up in New York, of course, I was sent to Hebrew school. So that was my first uh, foreign language that I actually studied. My parents were Yiddish speakers, and so they, uh, although their primary, uh, primary language was English, they used Yiddish when they didn't want my brother and me to understand. In junior high school, I began four years of Latin, had some French in high school, I had some German in college at the University of Rochester. Um, but when I graduated, I went to the Peace Corps, and I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Malaysia teaching some ESL, English as a second language, but also teaching high school math in the Malay language, which was a challenge, but uh, I really enjoyed it. And I began to realize that maybe my uh, my true calling was in the area of language languages. So I began uh, grad work in 1971 at University of Southern California, and um, I received my PhD um, after having done a dissertation on an aspect of Persian grammar, I actually lived in Iran from 1975 to 1976 and had plunged into the study of Persian. So when I got back, I switched my dissertation topic to one in Persian grammar, and uh, I had the privilege of working with a renowned linguist named Bernard Comrie and um, got my degree. And from there, it looks like you've spent a lot of time in communications. Yeah. Uh, actually, soon after I, uh, I received my doctorate, I decided that I wanted to see what the business world looked like. And so I was actually uh, working for a Los Angeles corporation for over 10 years. And then I had the opportunity to come back to the university, to USC, but not in the linguistics department. I actually wound up teaching business communication at the Marshall School of Business, which was actually a pretty good fit for me, given the fact that I had all this business experience. And then it seems to me linguistics is certainly communication. So I put it together. I discovered that there was such a thing as a department of business communication. And um, I wound up teaching there and I was there for uh, 15 or so years. And so mid 2000s, you were teaching communications. You were director of the Center for Management Communication around that time. Uh -huh. And uh, at that point, were you approached by James Cameron or did you respond to a call? H how did you get involved with Avatar? Yeah, it was a really fortuitous sequence of events. This was in 2005. I had just become chair of my department. And a friend and colleague of mine in the linguistics department, uh, a professor named Ed Finnegan, forwarded me an email that had been sent to the department by James Cameron's production company, Lightstorm Entertainment. And they were looking for a linguist who could develop a language for a science fiction film. And Ed forwarded me the email and said, you know, I think this sounds like you. So I looked at it and said, oh, yeah, this is something I really would love to do. So I essentially applied for the job. I, I sent Cameron a copy of the book that Ed and I had co-authored. It's called Looking at Languages, and it's a workbook for students in an elementary linguistics class. And as it so happened, I had included among the exercises for the students one in Klingon. I had learned just enough Klingon to be able to construct an exercise and syntax for, the, for elementary students. So I don't know, maybe that impressed uh, 
Jim Cameron, but I was called in for an interview. I spent one of the most amazing 90 minutes of my life, just the two of us, in his private office talking about his visions for the film and so on. And it must have gone pretty well because at the end of that hour, uh, hour and a half, he, we stood up, shook hands, and he said, welcome aboard. And uh, my life has not been the same since. And I said in the episode that constructed languages didn't really become big business until after Avatar. There were people making up languages, but between Avatar and the internet just being able to connect with each other, it became a much bigger deal. Yeah. I really did not have a lot of experience prior to Avatar in constructing my own language. I had done a little tiny bit of it for the workbook, uh, a list of words in a language I called Speak to Me. Uh, but it was just words and no uh, no grammar. But, of course, the thing that got it started, I think, in science fiction, at least in science fiction, films and TV was Klingon. And Mark Okerand constructed an incredibly uh, viable and complex and quite wonderful language. Uh, and after that, really, the idea of just having characters speak gibberish and calling it a language wouldn't cut it. And so, of course, post-Avatar, uh, there was Game of Thrones, and David Peterson constructed some wonderful languages, Dothraki and High Valyrian and so on. And at this point, it's kind of assumed that if there's going to be uh, a science fiction production, you've got to hire somebody to actually construct a real language. I might add, though, that the idea of language construction is not new. People have been doing it for literally hundreds, if not thousands of years. Uh, in fact, it's almost like an iceberg. What's above the water is the stuff that everyone is familiar with, Klingon and Dothraki and Navi and so on. But the six-sevenths of the iceberg that's below the water is really these, this, this, this army of wonderful language constructors who are just doing it for themselves, for the love of it. And there are people who have constructed amazingly complex and wonderful and rich languages, and sometimes they're the only ones who speak it. There's a whole uh, there's a whole society called the Language Creation Society, and they have conferences and get-togethers and meetups. Um, one of which I had the pleasure of attending. So it's 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 an enterprise that really tickles some people's fancy. I guess is one way of putting it. Mm-hmm. I've definitely seen that. I'm on the Conlang mailing list. Ah, okay. Uh, I, I've dabbled in constructing my own languages. Right. Ah, excellent. Something interesting about alien languages in particular, many constructed languages are designed uh, to be international languages for humans oh. or are designed to be fantasy languages. But alien languages have no common heritage with hu human languages. Like. Right. Japanese and Khoi Khoi are about as different as two languages can get, but they still share a common ancestor, even if it was 100,000 years ago. But you had to construct Navi, which doesn't have any connection with human languages. So how did you go about creating something totally different? Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, and it has a, <laughs> a fairly involved answer. But the first thing I think you have to think about when you're going to construct a language is why am I doing this? For whom am I doing this? In my particular case, it wasn't that I was doing it on my own. Uh, I had an assignment. And so I had to uh, consider very carefully what James Cameron wanted for his language. So what I would call the imposed constraints on me, the things that came from the outside were, it had to be an entirely new language. Uh, he wanted it to sound nice. Now, of course, that's very much in the ear of the beholder. What is a nice sounding language? Uh, as it turns out, people seem to like the sound of Navi, which I'm happy about. There would be no electronic manipulation of the voices. And the assumption was that the vocal production mechanism of the Navi was very similar to that of human beings, which means that actors could actually make the sounds. I mean, this would not necessarily be the case for every alien language, obviously. Mm -hmm. But in this particular case, that was that was the going assumption. 
Another interesting constraint, though, which definitely puts your constructed language in a, in a certain box, is that the language had to be learnable by human beings. Because according to the story, the sky people who came to the moon, Pandora, many of them actually learned the Navi language and could communicate with the Navi in their language, which means that the language had to have a certain form. Any linguist could come up with a language with grammatical rules that would be logical and consistent, which a computer might be able to handle, but no human being would be able to process it in a natural way. But in this particular case, the bottom line, I guess, was that it had to be a human-like language, which is to say sounds that are producible by humans, grammar which is learnable by humans. And so it it, it turned into a language which could conceivably be a human language, but with a structure that's entirely different from any existing human language. That's kind of the idea. And, and then, of course, you begin the actual process of constructing the language. One constraint that I, that, that I uh, should have mentioned is that Jim Cameron had come up with about 30 words of his own. Now, these were mainly place names, names of animals, a couple names of characters. And so whatever phonology, whatever sound system I came up with had to be something which would incorporate the sounds and the structure of the words that he had come up with. Uh, so I did. I looked at, the, at, at his words and realized that it had a bit of a Polynesian sound to it. And so... Uh, I took that as a base, but I also added sounds and sound combinations, which are entirely unknown in Polynesian languages. I also had constraints that I imposed on myself. I knew, for example, that there would be a small but vocal subset of viewers, film goers, who would pounce on the language and examine it with a microscope. And that meant that it had to stand up to scrutiny. It had to be linguistically viable. I wanted to make it interesting. I wanted to make it unusual in the sense that people would say, hmm, I've never seen that before. Another consideration was to balance what I call complexity with accessibility. So it's easy to, to err in one of two directions. You can make the language so incredibly complex that people will look at it, people who might want to actually learn the language, look at it and say, there's no way I can ever master this. And I think that has happened uh, with certain constructed languages. On the other end, you can make it so simple that people just lose interest. So um, I try to achieve a middle ground to make it challenging, but still doable. And uh, I I feel good about, about how it turned out because people seem to... Uh, seem to like the challenge, but perhaps we'll talk about this a little later. There is a language community that has arisen since the film where people actually use the language for genuine communication. I mean, it's not a stunt. I get people text me in, in Navi all the time. People send me emails in Navi. And so, um, and so it, 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 in that respect, it, I, I think it's turned out pretty well. And, you know, just in general terms, uh, I think the flip side of this accessibility idea would be the movie Arrival with, with the heptapod language, which is this nonlinear language that was deliberately made very difficult for humans to understand. Right. Yeah. That is a very, a very different enterprise. And I, I, I found it absolutely fascinating. I actually read uh, Ted Chang's short story that it, was, that it was based on. I liked the movie very much. Of course, the the notion that you can learn a language and then all of a sudden have access to the past and the future. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not sure that's, that's going to fly, but uh, I, I, I really liked how, um, how they approached the, uh, the language and the kind of things that a linguist might do to be able to decipher something so alien and so, and so complex. Yeah. And for Navi, you say you had learned just enough Klingon to set some exercises in it. Uh huh. Uh, and had you read much Tolkien? Did you know any Elvish? I actually did not. No, I, I knew of Tolkien. I knew of the languages, but no, I had no experience in his languages at all. So, so this was really from scratch, and you had not really looked at many other constructed languages. Correct. Yeah. 
So, I mean, what you're going to do when you construct a language, there are certain what you might call modules. It, it's a fairly set pattern. So the first thing you want to do is consider the sounds and the sound system of the language. Linguists call it phonetics and phonology. So phonetics means what sounds will be in the language and just as importantly, what sounds will not be in the language. Um, I sometimes compare it to uh, to cooking. If you're making a stew and you open your your spice cabinet and you take out every single spice that you have and dump it into the stew, you're going to have a mess and you're going to have something without any particular character. But if you're uh, if you choose wisely and you limit your choices to something that's interesting, then you have something as a result that has a certain character to it. So, for example, Navi has a lot of familiar sounds. It has but, uh, k, l, r, n, m, and so on. It also has some interesting sounds that are not found in Western languages. Uh, the things that have attracted most attention are these things called ejectives, which are sort of popping versions of what we call voiceless stops. So there's but, uh, k, but there's also a and u and e, where the uh, the consonant is made with a different airstream mechanism. It actually comes from the glottis rather than from your lungs. Uh, now, these are human sounds, and they're found in uh, Native American languages. They're found in certain African languages in, in, in Ethiopia, for example. They're found in certain Asian languages. And so I added that to the mix, and that's attracted a fair amount of attention. And um, the actors had a lot of fun trying to nail those sounds. And most of the time, it came out it came out pretty well. Sounds that are not found in Navi, common sounds. Okay, we don't have voiced stops, so there's no b, there's no d, there's no g, there's no ch, there's no sh. Okay, okay. So th that's what we call sort of the inventory of uh, of phones, if you like. It has seven vowels. It has pseudo vowels which I've spelled L, L, and R, R. So there's a word, G, which means ground, K, L, L. And there's a word, dr, which means day. But just because you've determined the sounds in the language doesn't mean you're done. Then you have to think about things like what sort of combinations of sounds you can have. What sort of consonant clusters? For example, um, two or more consonants that occur at the beginning of a syllable. Is that possible in your language? Uh, in certain languages, that's absolutely excluded. Japanese doesn't have consonant clusters. Navi has consonant clusters. Some of them are quite unusual. So we have words that can begin with um, FP. And in fact, uh, the ejective version of, of P. So the word for enter is Akin, Akin, spelled FPX. The word for weep is Tsnaovic, and it's T-S-N-G. Okay, so that's a consonant cluster, which actually I've never come across in any language, but it's doable, and it exists in the language. By the same token, there are some very familiar consonant clusters, K-L, for example, which don't exist in now. Uh, then you have to think about positions of, of sounds. Just because you have a particular sound doesn't mean that it can exist in all positions in a word. So, for example... Navi has a sound S, but a word cannot end in S. The other side of that coin is that now Navi has an NG sound, N, which is common in English. We spell it NG. Linguists call it a, v, a, a velar nasal. And we have it all over the place at the end of words and sometimes in the middle, middle of words. But we do not have words in English that begin with that NG sound, N. However, Navi does. The word for you is nga, N-G-A. That, by the way, was probably the single most difficult thing for the actors to master. Taking a familiar sound and putting it in an unfamiliar place, which was a lot of fun. And then finally, you have to think about what we call phonological rules. For example, are there situations in which one sound will change into another sound under certain uh, through certain grammatical uh, processes and so on. So yeah, so in Navi on occasion, 
a T will turn into an S and a K will turn into an H and a P will turn into an F and so on. So all of these things are things you have to determine before you even begin constructing words. So that's phonetics and phonology. Now the next module, so to speak, is morphology, which is putting together your words. So what do the verbs look like? What do the nouns look like? Will the verbs be inflected? Will they agree with the subject in, in number, in person? In English, for example, um, we have walk, I walk, you walk, but for he, she, and it, it's walks. Okay, so that's one little change that English does. Many languages have many more changes than that. So are you going to have that kind of stuff on your verbs? Uh, will you nouns have cases, which is to say, will they have little markers, typically at the end of a word, but sometimes in other places, which indicate grammatical relations in a sentence, a subject, uh, an object, a possessor, an indirect object, and so on. So those are things that, that have to be determined. For the verbs, for example, and this is a fairly typical approach that I took, I took something which is found in human languages, but kind of expanded it and put it on steroids. So, for example, in Na'vi, inflections for tense, which is time, and aspect, which is whether you view an action as ongoing or complete, there are little parts of the, the little elements that 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 attach to a verb to indicate those things but rather than them being suffixes at the end of the root or prefixes at the beginning of the root they are infixes now this exists in languages but not to any great extent but in Navi, that's the only way you do it you take these little particles and then shove them into the middle of a root so for example the root word for hunt is taron, spelled T-A-R-O-N. To say that hunting has been completed, you say tolaron. So the O-L part has been shoved into the middle of the root, right after the T. Uh, something, will hunt is tayaron, may hunt divaron. And then these can get fairly complex. You can have uh, words like termareon, which means has just hunted and I feel good about it, that sort of thing. So those are the kinds of things which you have to determine in terms of your morphology, in terms of your word building. The next module is syntax. How do the words fit together in phrases and sentences? And there you have to think about word order, for example. Is word order going to be important in your language as it is in English? Because um, the dog bit the cat is a different message from the cat bit the dog. However, in many languages, there are markers on the ends of those noun phrases, on the ends of the dog and the cat, to indicate subject and object so that you can mix up the words in any way you like, virtually any way you like, and it still means the same thing. And that's true in Natmi. So one of the hallmarks of Natmi syntax is that the word order is very free. For example, three major components of a sentence, subject, object, and verb, S-O-V. Mathematically, you have three things. You can order them in three factorial different ways, six different ways. Human languages tend to like S-V-O, subject, verb, object. They tend to like subject, object, verb. To a lesser extent, uh, you find languages that are verb initial, verb, subject, object. Object initial languages are extremely rare. In Navi, you can take any one of those six orders and it's still a grammatical sentence and it's still acceptable. So uh, those are the kinds of things that you have to think about in terms of syntax. Maybe the most interesting thing is relating the language to its environment and to the culture of the individuals who speak it. And that's where I think maybe the most creativity comes in. because. Uh, every language, to one extent or another, reflects the culture and environment of its speakers. And so I had to know enough about Pandora, enough about Na'vi culture, and even about Na'vi physiology, to be able to come up with something which would fit the Na'vi people. For example, I realized early on that 
the Navi have four digits on each hand rather than five. And so I said to myself, hmm, I bet they have an octal system rather than a decimal system. And so I talked to James Cameron, and he says, absolutely. So the Navi counting system is based on eight. And so to count, you go, au, mune, a, sing, mr, puka, kina, vol, vol is eight. And then nine is vola, which is eight and one. And 10 is vomu, which is eight and two and so on. So that's one thing. Obviously, you have to come up with words for objects in their environment, for animals, for plants in their environment. But one of the things that I really had fun with was coming up with particular expressions in the language, proverbs, for example, comparisons, similes, metaphors, uh, which would work in, in their language and in their environment. And for example, this was not mine. This was something that someone came up with in the community. Um, we have a proverb, which means the tail and the ears also speak. And if you look at the Navi in, uh, in the film, you notice that their tails are always moving and the ears are moving and it kind of reflects their particular mood. And so the message is don't just listen to the words, look at the body language as well. It's also true that a lot of proverbial expressions in a language rely on word play in the language and rely on the actual sounds of the words to come up with an expression which is memorable. So for example, in English, we say a stitch in time saves nine. Okay, why nine? Why not seven? Why not uh, 13? Well, because time and nine have a, have a, a, a sound similarity. Okay. so. It was fun to come up with proverbial expressions which involved wordplay. So, for example, one expression we have in Navi is kem amawiya kum afet. Literally, it means honorable action, bad outcome, bad result. So you use that when, you know, you had the best intentions in the world, but things didn't work out well. Why is this a good proverb? Because it relies on the similarity between kem, which means action, and kum, which means result. Kem amawiya, kum afe. Another one like that is, um, this is one of my favorites. Fweke kefwefwi. Fweke kefwefwi. Okay, literally, this means a mantis doesn't whistle. Okay, so there's an insect on Pandora that's very similar to a praying mantis here. And... When you say a mantis doesn't whistle, what you're saying is don't expect someone to do something that's not natural for them. That's not in their natural repertoire, so to speak. Now, why is this a good proverb in Navi? Because of the similarity in sounds between mantis, fweke, and whistle, fwefwi, fweke, kefwefwi. So those are, you know, some of the things that go into creating a language which hopefully is suitable and appropriate for the people who speak it. And have you been involved with the way of water? Yes. Has that needed uh, much new development of the language or just sort of applying what's already there? Well, uh, I would love to be able to say a lot about it. Uh, what I can tell you is that uh, the language is present and the movie is going to be fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid I can't say very much. Uh, understandable. Now, you did create one other language that has appeared in theaters, which is Barsoomian in right. Disney's John Carter, which is their adaptation of Edgar Rice Burroughs' A Princess of Mars. Yeah. And, of course, that's a very different approach uh, because it is an alien language, but Edgar Rice Burroughs had a much larger lexicon in his book, even though he didn't have uh, a grammar to it. Yeah. Yeah, that was uh, a very different uh, assignment and I had to take a, a, a different approach to it. So, yeah, so you're right. The um, I, I think it's an 11-volume series, the Barsoomian series, if, if I'm not mistaken. Something like that. Yeah. So I didn't go through every book, but fortunately, there's a labor of love. It's it's essentially an encyclopedia for the Barsoom series. Unfor I'm, I'm blanking on the author right now. I should know that. But... Through that and through looking at the books themselves, 
I realized there was something like 420 words that Edgar Rice Burroughs had come up with. As you said, no grammar whatsoever. There was precisely one sentence, which consisted of one word, which was the word sock, which means jump. And beyond that, no grammar. So the first thing I had to do was um, try to figure out a coherent sound system which would incorporate his spellings and the way he had constructed these these words. And of course, he had to do a little speculation. He writes CH, for example, a lot. Okay, what does he mean by CH? It could very well be CH as in church. It could also be SH as in machine. It could be K as in chorus. It could be CH as in Hanukkah. And so you had all these possibilities. So those are the kinds of decisions I had to make. As for the grammar, that actually was fairly easy because, let me quote you a line from the first volume of the series of Princess of Mars. So when John Carter arrives on Barsoom and he's talking about the language, he says, the Martian language is extremely simple. And in a week I could make all my wants known and understand nearly everything that was said to me. So I said to myself, whoa, <laughs> I'd love to see a language like that. But that let me know that, yeah, you can do a very, very simple grammar, something that could be grasped very simply. So I did that. But um, it turned out very well. The um, I, I, I never developed the language beyond the needs of the movie. So it was perfectly adequate for the needs of the movie. One big difference between working on Avatar and working on John Carter was that in Avatar, I was able to work directly with the actors myself. And actually, I had the privilege of being on set for a lot of the... Uh, of the shooting. With John Carter, there was an intermediary. I uh, I conveyed the stuff to a dialect coach who was there on set, and then she worked worked with the actors. Yes, and you know the, the scope of a constructed language is something that can vary a lot. Mark Rosenfelder in the Language Construction Kit talks about naming languages, which is sort of what Edgar Rice Burroughs was doing originally, creating a language only as much as he needed to name things and people. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I guess a lot of people, <laughs> sort of a naive approach to language construction is, you know, just tell me what this is called, tell me what this is called, tell me what this is called, and then you have a language. Well, of course you don't. There's a lot there, There's a lot more that goes into it than that. I, I, I don't know what Edgar Rice Burroughs' linguistic background was. I suspect it was not a terribly sophisticated one. But still, it served it served his needs. And so for either Navi or Barsoomian, did you end up changing any any of the phonology from the source material just to make it more consistent, or did you follow it strictly? Yeah, well, for Barsoomi and for John Carter, um, what I came up with in terms of phonology, I think, worked with everything that he had come up with. And so I made sure that whatever system I came up with was consistent with everything that that, that he had done. For Navi, of course, it was pretty much up to me. And so the phonology remains very consistent. And if you want to construct your own word and not me, you have to know a lot because you can't just write down something and say, okay, this is going to be not me. There are, there are some very strict, what we call phonotactic rules for word construction. And you have to know what's as I mentioned before, what words can be, what, what sounds rather can be at the end of a word, what sounds can be at the beginning of a word, what combinations and so on. There were a few things that uh, in retrospect, I might have done a little differently only because some of them were pretty challenging for actors, but they all gave it their best. And for the most part, it came out extremely well. There was, I'll tell you one interesting thing that happened for one particular shoot, there was an actor who had some Navi to, uh, to say. And when I listened to the playback, I realized that one word was quite different from what I had intended. And I said, hmm, what was that? But fortunately, it turned out to be perfectly viable in terms of Navi phonology. It could very well be a Navi word. So I said, well, let's see, what could it possibly mean in the context of this sentence? And so I looked at it and realized that it could very well be a word that meant however. And we didn't have a word for however. And so guess what? That actor uh, unintentionally 
coined a nappy word, and now it's an, an official part of the language. Th those kinds of things don't happen very often, but when they do, it's kind of fun. Since Avatar, and of course you have been involved with The Way of Water, but uh, over the intervening years, you have mainly been focused on Navi, as opposed to going the David Peterson route and creating a dozen different languages. Correct. And is that mainly because you liked Navi so much, or uh, because you also have uh, your academic job or some combination of the two? Yeah. Um, well, you know, I'm uh, I'm up there in terms of uh, where I am in my life. And right now, Navi is keeping me, I think, as busy as I would like to be. It's not just the film, by the way. There are lots of projects that come along which have to do with the language. There was a wonderful Cirque du Soleil production called Toro. And that involved surprising amount of Navi. There was a lot of Navi dialogue. And so I had a lot of fun coming up with the dialogue and working with, uh, with the people in that production to get it accurate. Um, there is a theme park that's been around for, for years now in Orlando based on Avatar, based on Pandora. Uh, and there's a fair amount of the language in that theme park. When visitors enter the park, they're given a, a pamphlet which is a guide to the park and shows them what they can expect and has descriptions of the things they're going to see. And on the pamphlet, there is a section of do's and don'ts, how to conduct yourself, you know, don't touch this and don't feed the animals and so on. And that's bilingual. It is in English and Navi, which is the, 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 a lot of fun to do. Another thing that's been taking up quite a bit of my time is the video game. There's going to be a gigantic and I think quite wonderful video game. Given the fact that I'm close to 78, you can probably predict that I am not a gamer. <laughs> but I have become extremely impressed with the incredible amount of effort and care and meticulousness that goes into constructing a video game. And so that's been another project I've been working on, working with the actors and coming up with the linguistic needs for the video game. So all those things together um, are keeping me pretty busy. Plus, I have a blog on the language where I introduce new vocabulary. I mean, th there's no such thing as the language being finished because we're constantly adding vocabulary to it. And even at this late date, I discover little corners of syntax that I hadn't thought about, which need uh, elucidation. And so there's sometimes very, very heated debate among the Navi community as to how something should go. And I sometimes adjudicate those debates. So all of those things are keeping me pretty busy. I'm, I'm really quite satisfied with the way that's all going. I, I, I should also add, uh, add Avatar The Way of Water is coming out at the end of this year on December 16th. But there are three more sequels. And so those are going to be keeping me busy as well. Yeah, this is long anticipated, certainly. Long, long anticipated, absolutely. Was it always planned to be five movies? Uh, yeah. Well, I, always. I, I, I can't say that for a fact. But at this point, there are a total of five movies planned, yeah. And you talked about how nowadays it has become standard if you're writing sci-fi story with uh, an alien language that you're going to, at least for a movie, you're going to hire someone to create a language for it. And while we were preparing for the interview, you mentioned audiences can tell the difference between a constructed language and just random gibberish. And to you, what is that difference? Yeah, I've been thinking about that, and it is, it is really an interesting question. Um, you know, I, I guess it's an empirical question, and I guess you could actually conduct an actual, you could set up a study, really to see if audiences do react differently to gibberish as opposed to a well-constructed language. Uh, my hunch is that they do, and perhaps a, a major reason is that the actors will be more convincing if they know what the words are, and they know that this particular word is a key word, and this particular word is just a grammatical word which does not have to be emphasized. And if they can if, if, if they can break down a sentence, then they know how to 
Well, they, they know where to place the emphasis. They know how to, they know what kind of intonation to use for the sentence, that kind of thing. Just, just for, the, for the part of the actor, I think it can sound more convincing when it turns into a real language. There's also the question of whether or not the large part of the audience that will not delve into language, whether or not they will still almost unconsciously be able to hear connections from one line to another and uh, from one scene to another and maybe certain words will uh, will pop out and and they realize that there's a consistency. For, for example, the word Ewa in Navi is ubiquitous. Okay, Ewa is the goddess who protects the balance of life and she's invoked a lot. And I have, I have a sense that even if people don't focus on that, they will be able to hear that similarity in a lot of different contexts. So perhaps that's 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 the reason. So again, I I I I, th I think it's an empirical question, but in a sense, it's moot because at this point, you simply will not get away with gibberish. You really have to mm -hmm. have the real language because, as I say, there'll be people who will be looking at it in you know in great detail. Although I think it would be an interesting experiment to try pe people on uh, fully developed language versus gibberish with a consistent non-English phonology. Yeah, that that would that, that that would in fact be very interesting. Yeah. And we have a few minutes. If you want to talk about it, you were commissioned to create a language for another movie, which uh, ultimately was cut from the film. Yeah. That movie was Aliens in the Attic, mm -hmm. and you. Uh, of course, you took that as another assignment and took that in its own direction. Right. That that was fun to do. I, I must say, the, the thing that stands out for that language in terms of the phonology is that I used some implosives, which are sounds that I don't think I've heard in constructed languages, at least not the ones I'm familiar with. So in addition to b, d, and g, there are sounds in human languages that sound like b, d, d, where you're pulling the air in rather than pushing the air out. Um, the language that has those sounds that I'm most familiar with is Vietnamese. And so I figured this would be kind of fun. Let's put some implosives for these little aliens. They were animated aliens. And uh, it was a, 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 a fun film. Definitely it was a fun film. Again, I developed the language to be perfectly adequate for the needs of the movie and for the needs of the lines that they had to say. And I actually worked with, with some of the voice actors to help them pronounce the lines. But when I saw the movie, uh, I quickly realized that I was not going to hear the language <laughs> because uh, the decision had apparently been made that it would be better, given the audience for the film, if the alien spoke English. How difficult was it to teach the voice actors to make implosives as opposed to adjectives? Yeah, um, I'm trying to remember. They they were a very talented group. I mean, I, I, I think perhaps they're used to having some weird assignments, and so they uh, they actually did it pretty well, if I recall. There was also um, uh, a distinction in vowel length, and so, uh, for example. Ta and ta would be two different words, and so they had to they had to nail that as well. Mm -hmm. So if I if I ever do another uh, another constructed language, I may very well go back to some of those things. I don't know about voice actors, but I have heard that like uh, professional choirs will learn to sing in IPA rather than ah uh, specific languages. Very interesting. One thing about singing, of course, is that it's certainly true in English, and I bet it's true in other languages as well other human languages, that singers will sometimes change sounds either deliberately or, or unconsciously in order to be able to make them more singable. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, so, that happens a lot in French because French uh, has so many final you, silent E's. Right, 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 right. Yeah, exactly. And so even in Navi for some of the, of the songs, the vowels, for example, can be a little bit different. But I think there's a very natural thing. And, and, and it, it does help the, the voice, the, the vocal production. This is a very interesting discussion. 
looking forward to see your work in the way of water. And what is the name of your blog? It's called Naviteri. It's spelled N-A-V-I-T-E-R-I dot org. Uh, that simply means about Navi. It, it should have an apostrophe, but apparently in URLs you can't have apostrophe. So I got to take that out. Yeah. I think they allow non-English characters now, but you still don't see it a lot. Right. Yeah. So thank you again for coming. Uh, it's been fun. It's been a pleasure talking with you, Alex. Take care. Give up. See you again. This has been a Reader's History of Science Fiction. This podcast is available most anywhere you listen to podcasts. I don't even remember the full list anymore. If you want to see more of my work, you can find me on YouTube at Science Meets Fiction. Look for a new math video there this week. I'm on Twitter at Sci Meets Fiction. And my website is sciencemeetsfiction.com. And Dr. Frummer's blog is naviterry.org. There's not a recommendation in this episode per se, but I think he would recommend the upcoming Avatar The Way of Water. The next episode will be about sci-fi in anime, and it's going to be something of an experiment because I'm going to try bringing in a co-host for the first time. Because I'm not an anime fan, and I have friends who are a lot more knowledgeable about it than I am. So we'll see how that works out. Thanks for listening.